Lewis Carroll writes in Chapter 2 of Alice in Wonderland Through the Looking Glass, When I use a bird, Humpty Dumpty said, in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master, that's all. For some of us, political correct speech is a way of expressing their concern with other people's feelings. We try to use no hurtful speech. It is a way of being humane with words. For others, it only is an unnatural course to naturally grown language. The specific phenomena, political correctness, might not be the only language regulation known to mankind, but one that emerged extensively in the last decades in the whole Western Hemisphere, make it notable on a global scale and dripping in everyday conversation. The questions asked here are supposed to build an overview of what is taught nowadays about the interconnection of language and society. Where do all these slogans used to defend the practice of speech policy have their source? Where do the quotes of those correcting other people's language on a day-to-day -day basis find their academical bondon. From which academical background do phrases like language is power, language is action, language is a weapon, words hurt, etc. come from? What place does the intention of the speaker take, which is held so dearly by Humpty Dumpty? For those studying in the field of literature, the content of the opening quote often has a familiar ring to it, not because everyone attentively followed Alice's adventure, but from the connection that is made between power and language, which is taught nowadays at humanitarian faculties worldwide. Deconstructivism. Deconstructivism teaches us that power lies within language, or rather that power decides what language is supposed to mean. This video is merely a who said what, of academical graveness in the field, asking what did the theorist the political movement is built upon really write and what happens when we compare to the empirical work done to the subject on language in society. What is the knowledge we have about language? How do these theories fit with deconstructivism or dwarfism? Are the linguistic facts living up to the theories? The goal is to take a look at the interdynamics of language and power. This is merely a short overview of sources and research. Often there are purely theoretical arguments brought forward for which no empirical evidence exists. These are that language is discourse or power, language is action, language is performance, language is violence, the recipient always produces the text or the message. I have to confront you with some name droppery and put all of those names and their theories in tiny nutshells, free of the jargon all those books are stuffed with. Quite in a way, students are nowadays confronted with them in a way I was confronted with them in gender and cultural studies. Derrida's theories were based on the easily understood division of what a sign is according to de Saussure, the connection of arbitrariness, convention and association between form and the content. Even words like onomatopoeia, like cock doo or kikirigi differ in different languages because of this arbitrariness. To break it down, Derrida looked at the structure of society and saw that no meaning is ever fixed. So what do we do with this? throw everything ever written into the wind, dance around the fire, laugh hysterically, call it a day? Well, no. Philosophers didn't get tired of interpreting and interpreting again and interpreting even more. The idea of the unfixed meaning got picked up by Lacan in the field of psychoanalysis, Bourdieu and Foucault in sociology, with Lacan stating that without language there would be no meaning of self and Bourdieu noting that what is meant and understood is a question of the position one takes in the social field. Meaning, as Foucault and his companions noted, was a manifestation of power and power is therefore reflected in discourse. 
someone first hearing about language being discourse and therefore Bauer might think, yeah, well, I mean, let's turn to knowledge about cognitive science. We know and this is a problem, for example, in court hearings that people can be talked that people can be talked into quite anything in a suggestive way as the satanic kindergarten example shows so impressively. This is really an exciting thought that can't be verified or falsified as no one stands outside society. And even knowledge taught at academia is inside the web of discourses. What Derrida originally suggested as a way of interpreting literature by finding oppositions and presumptions in it soon got to be an instrument to analyze a whole society. Deconstruction. Not only degrading even the most artistic pieces of writing to mere social commentary, but also dissecting everyday speech in everyday life. The premise was something like, the powerless must be deconstructing the discourse, not leaving the decision of what anything means to the powerful, because discourse is language. So, let's better the world. Then there comes a new wave of theorists like Deleuze, for example, or Said or Butler with a lot of suggestions. They claim that language is always action, it is always performance. That language is always action is supposed to go back to John Austin. But Judith Butler doesn't even quote Austin, not in gender trouble anyway, where she claims that society inscribes itself into the human body through language. She does not provide a conclusive argument how exactly this happens. There's no empirical work on it, and most paragraphs end with a question mark. She quotes Bourdieu and Derrida even in her work Excitable Speech. She rather presents everything originating from Austin with the interpretations of later theorists. But what is it that Austin actually said? Speech acts are acts of phones, which are the sounds coming out of one's mouth. And they are not only constative, which means describing the world, or performative, which means acting with words, but they can be both, much on a scale between describing and acting. If a ship is named, the performance is clearly visible, but also statements about the world can have a reason why they are said, which is often only to be found in their context. Even if someone talks to himself, there might be psychological reasons but does that change the world in any manner? You'd have to be a strong believer of the butterfly effect, how it is commonly understood, not the physical one, uh, to agree with a statement like that. Today, speech acts are still classified by Austin's system. This means that those new theories are ignoring something he was fully aware of by calling the center of his science the acts of phones. It's the sound you hear, the form it takes. Everything else, the statement about the world, the action itself and the intentions of the speaker are different parts of speech. The form takes a special place in every theory of speech and communication. The one thing that can only be judged aesthetically, if it can be judged at all. Making this crucial distinction is the very base of 20th century linguistics because it goes back to Ferdinand de Saussure's signifiant and signifié, the form and the content. Cinefier and the cinified. While Austin, when read closely, can't serve to legitimize the language policing, he might still be seen as authority on language philosophy. People throwing his name around tend to ignore his work. Intention as part of his speech act classification is then substituted by convention, which is seen more powerful in, for example, Butler's excitable speech. The act of phones, on the other hand, gets simply ignored. The highly selective method of reading early theorists, philosophers and empirical field workers on the subject leads to arguments built on authority, even though their authority never might have written anything closely to lead to nowadays conclusions. So John Austin never claimed that every utterance in every situation is performance and therefore action. He just played with the thought that we can't draw an exact line between the description of the world and acting with words. So the premise of the deconstructivist theory widens. The powerless must be deconstructing the discourse, 
not leaving the decision of what anything means to the powerful. Discourse is language, language is action, and therefore language can be violence. The last of the purely theoretical arguments that can be found is Roland Barthes with Qu'est-ce que c'est un auteur, who took care of any intention or convention altogether, giving the recipient the full power over the meaning. Barthes' writing denies all of this convention, context, intention. But if the recipient is the one mostly producing the text, that doesn't always make individual interpretation righteous. It makes it rather a mere question of what most people read into something. Also, if the recipient is the one producing the meaning, this very same theory could be used as legitimization that the writer or producer of speech is always free of guilt. And any misunderstanding is the recipient's fault, like Elizabeth Lies did or Akhmatova with the female part of the population not being mentioned explicitly. As we know, the truth lies rather in between, as miscommunication tends to happen but can be dealt with. If we take Bart's writing altogether, we see he'd also call fashion a language. The logical conclusion would be that even a rapist claiming she was asking for it, shifting the blame to the victim of a violent crime, would be right. Bart also got criticized in Foucault's Qu'est-ce que c'est un auteur for his approach in 1969 in front of the Société Française de Philosophie. It is highly doubtful that Derrida would recognize his own thinking in the politicized strategies his successors knit out of them. The premise of the deconstructivist theory widened even more. The powerless must be deconstructing the discourse, not leaving the decision of what anything means to the powerful. Discourse is language, and language is action, therefore language can be violence. The recipient of speech is always right about its meaning, so if the recipient feels offended, the speaker has to be hanged. Wait, what? Condemned. That's a rather short summary of how we got from understanding that the form is not shackled to its content to quite a significant amount of people in academia being sure that changing forms would change the world. So the basic premise seems right even if unverifiable, but in Austin's writing circumstances, purposes and intentions have to result in a certain situation. While in early deconstructivism logical arguments are followed like Derrida and Foucault and Bourdieu, they don't provide arguments for language policy. Later theorists, like for example Butler, rather depend on claims and suggestions, reproducing concepts as slogans in a highly selective manner. Since de Saussure, no empirical fieldwork can be found on any of these theoretical approaches. So let's look on arguments we do have empirical evidence for. The claim that language influences everyday culture. One more reason that Language constructs the world credo is so attractive might also be found in Benjamin Lee Worf's writing. He was a contemporary of Wittgenstein and built his ideas from a theory sticking to it until his very end. If a culture has no word for something, said culture doesn't have an said thing. Did you know that the Italians have a single word for the little ring of spilled coffee on a coaster table when you take the cup away? It's called Culacino, I was told. We do know this thing, we wipe it away with a napkin, but do we have a word for it in English, German or Russian? No. But believing in language being functional, I'm pretty sure I did a sufficient job expressing what I mean. There also needs to be considered that Worf was not being exactly the empirical type. He claimed that Eskimos, as they were called in his days, have hundreds of words for snow. That is simply not true. There are only two lexemes from which all other words derive from. It is a highly complex language. But barely anyone bothered. The idea was so tempting, lifting up language into even more powerful spheres than it even is, that even in 1980, Dale Spender just assumes that Worf is right in man-made language. The discrepancy of what is proven and what isn't is not even noticed in the 1990s, when Deborah Cameron in Feminist Linguistics quotes Saussure's theory of the sign and Worf in the same breath. She just concludes that they would not be likely to agree with one another. Let's take another example. In gender studies they talk a lot about how amazing this tribe of Quechua south of the Titicacasi is, as they have ten social genders. 
which is pretty amazing. In the World Atlas of Language Structures, which was originally published by the Oxford University Press in 2005, it is now being digitally maintained by departments of the Max Planck Society in Leipzig, I noticed something odd. The Quechua have no distinction of gender in their language. But there do exist languages with five genders or more, like the Zulu, for example, are notified under this one. But in their culture, they only recognize exactly two genders, not even a third one. My pick of samples here would suggest that less gender in a language might allow for more gender possibilities in cultures. But don't be led by any confirmation bias. It isn't true. You can pick a hundred more examples and will come to one conclusion. It is arbitrary. But, and here comes the exciting part, with the help of surveys and computerized tests, we are nowadays in a position to check up on theories like that in the most precise way. Today, you can watch a TED Talk video from Lera Boroditsky, a cognitive scientist, who takes a neo-Warfian approach, claiming that nowadays we do have all the data we need. We know, she explains, that people whose language puts time into order vertically rather than horizontally are faster to orientate the vertical way, or orientating by directions as north and south changes how they put things in order, how Russian has two words for blue and so on. So yes, there is data. Yes, it is empirical. It also might have something to do with writing directions in some cultures, but as John McWhorter shows impressively in the language hoax, often differences are about milliseconds and therefore without any influence on everyday lives of people. Because in the end, every language can express anything. And we are more the same than we are different. In my personal view, that's the preferable outcome. Boroditsky also talks about something that got hold of German public language. She talks about gender in language and how it shapes thought. She explains that in languages, as in German, a bridge has got a female article and people loaded in tests with female stereotypes, beautiful, elegant, etc. In languages in which bridge has a male article, people would say strong or robust. She suggests the article is changing the view of the world. But is it really? Isn't it rather a chicken and egg problem? But m and the meaning was there before the word even was, as it often happens. Because maybe history of language might tell us that articles in Indo-Germanic languages had other dimensions of indicating meaning attached to them, as for example in the Germanic language, things of use around the household would have a female article, no matter which language they originated from or what article or gender they might have been used with in another language. The historic development, parts of comparative linguistics and the arbitrariness of language as ignored in neo warfianism Well, words don't arise out of a vacuum and their history is a muddy one. The second argument brought forward with empirical work done on it is that language raises awareness and challenges prejudices. Now, we arrived not only at the researching but also consulting part. Linguists want to raise awareness and reframe. In the German official communication, people are now obligated to use the male and the female form in any reference to humans to make the female part of a group visible. Not only does this already seem troublesome for those who are neither male nor female, but we have already taken a look at the Quechua. There are a lot of people doing research on this. There are on Academia EU more than 80,000 articles with the subject of gender and language, a lot of them purely theoretical, reproducing the theoretical claims I've already talked about here, and quite a few thousand, hard to say at this point, empirical research papers. So let's take a look at their research. Suggesting new terms, as McWhorter noted about Lakoff, or even new phrases or framing is only temporary. Stephen Pinker coined the term the euphemism treadmill. So what's it about? People are not supposed to use one word, so they will use another to replace it and in no time it will fulfill the previous one's function. Fill the semantic hole 
and sound as tainted as the original one. But what is it that sound? It is the everlasting game between connotation and denotation. And we knew those things, which means they have been checked empirically before all of those theories above evolved. In 1880, a book was published in Germany by the linguist and lexicographer Hermann Paul, who put the German language under close examination. It was called The Principles of the History of Language. One of the most intriguing chapters is called Language Shift, following the question on how language actually changes. He also, with quite some casualness, made the distinction between change of phones, the form, and how a word sounds differently than in earlier stages of a language and the shift of meaning. For example, he takes the German word for woman, Frau. If a word is overused, it is likely to lose connotations and the meaning will widen. The word derived from the medieval Frohe, which in the beginning meant a noble woman and later became the word for all women, pushing aside the word weep. So it lost the connotation of aristocratic heritage. Was there a powerful uprising of women in the Middle Ages we somehow missed? By no means. But minstrels and poets started to use the word in their songs for common women to express how special they were in their eyes. The habit got picked up by common people and voila, the meaning changed. To feel the semantic gap for aristocratic women, noble had to be explicitly added after this change. So what happens if a word gets lost or prohibited? And make no mistake, attempts to change language forcefully are to be found all through history. The phenomenon is nothing new. Does the meaning disappear? We know that words disappear if whatever they named goes out of existence or use. But the other way around? The connotation just happily hops onto the next best thing. People just would use the next best word in the previous sense and that's what it would become. We might just overuse words like Kant or Nega, and the connotation will wash out eventually if we try to use it in an alternative context. It might just lose the connotation of being an insult. A strategy adapted, for example, by the hip-hop group NWA. The effect of NWA's approach was rather small as language change only happens with applied by the great mass of speakers of any language. Alternatively, applied only to whites, the word might lose the meaning of referring to what nowadays seems to be called people of color. With Kant, we have the connotations of an insult, female and genitalia. Would we openly apply to men and most likely would lose connotation of referring to females? Applied in a more neutral sense or even a pet name, it might lose its insulting quality. So we can see now how it works, but is this helpful? What happened when the new Soviet regime in Russia introduced the word activist in a positive manner? It became a slur. Also, something else happens with phrases of inclusion, and it is happening with singular words. They are prone to another common misbelief. Just by telling everyone the word they are using is racist or sexist, and an insult they might stop using it, and both these things will be abolished in perpetuity. Sometimes the terms are then used in ironical ways. Even in polite form, unfriendly contact can appear, as for example in Vienna, even the word person can be used as an insult. If there is meaning to be expressed, it will find its expression. The trouble with framing and substitution of phrases by linguistic consultants is that they are not long-lived because of the euphemism treadmill. Then there are still methodological questions. Some papers stay purely theoretical on the weak legs we talked about before. But there are also questions about the research. For one, the methodological question about finding an answer to a question. Participants are often from the own peer group of those creating the service and trying to prove the point about the power of language. Students from the very same field or within the political bubble, as we always have troubles to find participants for empirical work, this 
is something challenging for already a pretty long time. Secondly, the time frame between the theoretical work and the empirical study is often quite worrisome. Is data fully reliable if a theory, for example, language shapes the world, is propagated for 40 years in a certain social field and afterwards data is collected in exactly that field, asking women in that field if they might have the feeling that they are not included, if they are not mentioned. Possible solutions would be to repeat service in intervals to research the influence of academical framing of what is language supposed to as much as language shift requiring diverse groups of participants, which means to look for new ways to find participants or to observe language in the sociotope of social media where speech acts are not academically framed at all. So this is the data question. Our data is not exactly rock solid, especially as some psychological and psycholinguistical surveys do have enormously low replication rates. And there seems to exist a hard publication bias. What doesn't prove the theory, but contradicts it, simply doesn't get published in journals. There is no solution to terms and phrases being coined to make them last longer. Especially since the internet language shift goes faster and the treadmill turns faster with it. The correlation of reframing and language shift would be an interesting field to research in its own. So. I'm not one to tell you that language shouldn't be changed out of crude conservatism and language would go down because of change. In fact, language always changed, even though it might have been slowed down by the invention of printing techniques and sped up again by the internet. When an expression for something is necessary in a society, words will come up and the more people are using them, the better the chance the words will stick around for a while. There definitely is a chance for the they, them pronoun, for example. As we know, like everyone loves their mother, it kind of already exists. We would do well. Would we rather ask ourselves more often within human interaction whether an interpretation makes sense in a certain context without preemptively insinuating evil intentions on the other as trying to understand plays an important part in successful communication? I'm not talking about politics, but language, and I intend not to make anyone give up their ideals, as they in general tend to differ from person to person. But a strategy of political correctness to bring about change in the world is highly flawed. Can't we do anything, you might ask, realizing that language really is some kind of force? Here's the thing. Changing the form something takes won't do any good. Changing the content, on the other hand, is real change of discourse. As long as no one talks about a problem, it won't have a place in discourse and it won't be changed. Because much like water, language finds every little space of meaning that wants to be brought out into the world, if need be by ironic, sarcastic, hyperbolical use, and much more. In the end, language is always a bottom-up process and never top-down. Planned language change rarely ever ends up where it is supposed to, and whatever language change will be thrown at people, they will find ways of expressing their best and their worst. Because language is an ever-changing, unfixed system of signs and meanings, defined by one arbitrarily, endlessly buzzing, swarm-like thing, and one thing only, usage. Literature can be found 